He grew up on a working cattle ranch in Colorado, outside of Colorado Springs, uh -huh. right? And so he, he knows his way around that world. Went to UC Colorado studying architecture, then came out here to go to Brooks, got his degree in photography from Brooks, and then went to UCSB where he got a BA, an MA, and a, a doctorate degree out there in art history. Then he was teaching sort of all over the place for a long time, a number of junior colleges. Started teaching here in 1989, so he's been here for 21 years, full time since 2000. He probably holds the record, at least within the department, but maybe on campus, of teaching the most different classes. He has taught 18 different subject areas. Now, it's faculty people get what that means. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of preparation it takes to prepare for that over this time. He also uh, started teaching online classes in 2000, 10 years ago. And that class has always <coughs> been packed, full of people waiting uh, to get into that class. So he's well known within our building and being an extraordinary teacher. Outside of here, he's uh, a world traveler. He's been in 24 countries. He's been on every continent except Australia, he tells me. He was actually on five continents within a two-year time period. So you wonder, how is he teaching all those 18 classes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works, but he's pulling, pulling that out. So he travels a lot, loves music. I know he loves uh, drama and theater and, and film. He's a practicing artist. You can see his work upstairs in the show. Uh, he has a very pro provocative title here tonight for his lecture. If, if you haven't seen it, I'll read it to you. Yeah. <laughs> It's called Alcohol, Sex, Explosions, and More, a Sampling of Contemporary Art. So I sent this information out campus-wide, and I got an immediate email back from somebody else, <laughs> whose name will not be mentioned tonight. Well, should be. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I know. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And it starts with an expletive that I won't say. It goes, and then it says, this is an outrage, a moral abomination. When young people see this, it will cause them to drink, have sex, and all that stuff. <laughs> Probably play rock and roll at high volume, or even backwards. <laughs> Please save me a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all lucky to have a seat here tonight. Help us welcome Dr. Thomas Ellerson. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, Dane. It's a wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to it. Uh, it's, this room is my home, practically. I am quite used to teaching in here. I'm not quite used to having this rapt of an audience, however. Um, and about the title, I'm sorry, I'm not really talking about alcohol, sex, and explosions <laughs> yet. But what I uh, actually wanted to title this talk was, Who's Afraid of Contemporary Art? Because I could answer that question personally, because I was very afraid of contemporary art. In spite of the broad range of subjects I teach in art history, I have not studied contemporary art since I took a class at UCSB in 1988 when contemporary art, uh, well, art we were studying then as contemporary, we're now studying as historical. And so I had a sabbatical coming up, and I proposed as my sabbatical project to do a study of contemporary art and artists, wanting to identify a number of artists and trends in contemporary art that I could incorporate into some of my art history classes, mainly art of the late 20th century, art 104, which is a Renaissance to modern survey, and in my introduction to art classes online. And because of budget problems and other things, the, it took me three years in a row applying for the sabbatical before it was ever granted and funded. So by the time it was funded and the sabbatical rolled around in the fall of 1988, I, not, sorry, 2008, I was actually really fearful of my topic because by then the contemporary was even 
further along and I was faced with a bewildering array of artists that I needed to look at or eliminate. Uh, I'll explain the process that I went through in choosing the artists I did eventually study, uh, but uh, another title for this talk could have been what I did on my sabbatical. And, uh, and, and one of the reasons that I jumped at the chance when I was asked to give this talk is because uh, in my years here at Santa Barbara City College and seeing colleagues in the art department and other departments uh, go on sabbaticals, disappear for a year or a semester and come back, I realized I never knew what any of them did. There was never any real noticeable, visible, public sign of what they did on their sabbaticals. And I feel that's a great failing of the system here. Uh, and so I really welcome the opportunity to present my research uh, because I found it really interesting and I hope that you do too. Uh, as part of the sabbatical process, when you get back from a sabbatical, you have to write a report, a justification of the time off. And so I submitted my report to the sabbatical leave committee. With this as the opening page. Summary of sabbatical experience. They asked for this, so I gave it to them. I was on a sabbatical from 24 May to 2008 to 23 August 2009. During the 450 days of my sabbatical, I traveled to San Francisco three times, New York twice, Paris twice, London, Venice, Munich, and Istanbul. I visited 36 museums, 19 galleries, and viewed 92 art exhibitions. I saw 47 movies and 40 live performances, including 26 plays, 8 operas, 2 musicals, 1 Cirque du Soleil production, and 3 Philip Glass performances. I read 89 novels and 68 plays. I went to Starbucks 165 times. <laughs> I bought a new furnace, a new laptop, and an iPhone. I made 24 large collages, and I researched 24 contemporary artists. The sabbatical leave committee was not amused. <laughs> they said they didn't want the board of trustees knowing I went to Starbucks 165 times during my sabbatical. So I condensed my material and rethought my sabbatical leave report. And uh, what I ended up doing is writing critiques on the 24 artists I studied. Uh, the process by which I uh, I uh, chose the artists that I looked at. Uh, was r really pretty lengthy. What I did was I went through, because I was using, going to use these artists and their work in my survey classes, I initially did a, a uh, sort of a review of the either late 20th century or contemporary art sections of the art history survey textbooks. This have been Gardner's Art Through the Ages uh, by Kleiner, Jansen's History of Art, and Marilyn Stockstead's Art History. These are three major texts for survey of art history. I reviewed the last three editions of each of those texts and made lists of the artists that those authors included. But then uh, I, uh, as the texts were revised over the years, uh, I made note of what artists dropped out of the new t edition or which ones stayed in, or what new artists appear. So I end up with a very long list. And so what I did then was came up with matches. What artists were in all three of those books? And or um, basically uh, matches in that regard. Uh, and I came up with a shorter list, fortunately. But there were a whole bunch of artists on there that I didn't really want to look at, so I threw out some. And then there were uh, two artists that I really wanted to include, and so I just added them arbitrarily. I'm not going to talk about all of these today. I'm going to talk about these artists, though, and present you a few slides of their work. And generally, I'm going to read you a short biography for each artist, a discussion of what they do, 
And then the real meat of it is why I think they're important and why their work has lasting cultural value. This was important to me, being you know, of an analytical mind, but it, I think it's going to be important to students too, because the contemporary artists that we're presenting in our classes right now could be, and maybe should be, the artists that these young people are going to see for the rest of their lives. And so I, I uh, had to be discerning and uh, critical and justify and validate my choices for these artists by writing, by uh, coming up with a logical reason, a contribution that I saw this artist making to the world of contemporary art. Uh, I will apologize in advance for some of these slides. A lot of these artists, the only images available of their work is online, on the internet. And uh, if any of you have ever tried to project a lot of these images, they just aren't of high quality, high resolution. Uh, so a lot of these images are highly pixelated. I will try not to linger on them. Uh, and this is the order we're going to be looking at them. But that doesn't matter. Uh, Jeff Koons, probably one of the most famous artists living today. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1955. As a teenager, he was fascinated the with the work of Salvador Dali. He studied art at the Institute of Chicago and earned his BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. He worked on Wall Street while he established himself as an artist, which began to happen in the 1980s. With recognition, Coons immediately established an Andy Warhol-like factory in Soho in New York and staffed it with assistants who created aspects of his work. His early work was conceptual, but he quickly gained mo the most re sorry, recognition from his sculpture series of stainless steel enlargements of toys. He's also a shameless self-promoter. In 1992, he married Ilona Stoller, an Italian porn, porn star known as Il Ciccolina, and did a controversial series of paintings, photographs, and sculptures of the two of them having sex. I'm going to go through these images quickly. Uh, I would imagine that a lot of this work is familiar to some of you. Uh, most of this work was done in the late 80s or early 90s and is now something of classics of contemporary art. Michael Jackson and Bubbles. Kuhn's work, for all intents and purposes, is latter-day pop art mixed with his own styling of the age-old artist workshop system. This is truly an old age. Peter Paul Rubens had a studio and workshop. Andy Warhol had a studio and workshop. Coons, the artist, supplies the ideas and the assistants do the labor. Coons' most popular imagery is taken from objects associated with childhood like toys, balloons, animals, young animals, swim floats, other things, which makes his work really easily accessible and instantly recognizable and sometimes appealing. On another level though, besides the recognizability, is a sort of a darker motif. One can't help but have the suspicion that his work is a sustained commentary on the lack of the taste of the public. And, uh, and maybe even sort of a commentary on the gullibility of the wealthy people that can afford to buy his work. But an undeniable fact is that he, piece, his pieces are beautifully crafted and the surfaces of them, whether stainless steel, porcelain, wood, or paint, are perfect. They are exquisite, as a matter of fact. This is a topiary puppy, uh, which has appeared in several places around the world, uh, including um, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Here is Jeff and El Chocolino. Uh, he did a series of work based upon photographs of the two of them having sex. They hover on a boundary between high art and pornography. They are graphic 
it is somewhat shocking. What's shocking most to me is not the fact that they are adults having sex, but it is the sort of revelation of this very intimate aspect of his life. She was used to it, uh, being a porn star, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, I think, about the most overt sexual expression that an artist has ever made. Here's another photograph. Now, he took these photographs and had life-size sculptures made of them. This one's titled, Elona on Top. These are not unlike religious figures uh, in the materials and the representation that is included in them. This display of them uh, includes the photographs, uh, as you can see in the background, and a smaller scale glass sculpture. Now, this is actually where I discovered an aspect of this particular motif in Kunz's work that I found very appealing. Number one, the glass is beautiful. These are very well done little sculptures. But the real reason that I liked these is because for Kunz, they are so original. All the rest of his subjects of his sculpture are appropriations. But these are not only a complete departure from that manner of appropriation, especially the toys or things having to do with infants or things that would appeal to infants. These are very adult and exquisitely crafted in the process. Now, for the whole body of Kunz's work, his contribution is, it's, hard to describe because uh, there is a certain obscurity of meaning in his work. Uh, the early work, very lighthearted, very optimistic, uh, very much like the pop art movement that so inspired him. But in spite of the fact that he relies upon assistance to create his work, the concepts are his, the ideas are his, and the aesthetics are his. Even though he rejects critical contemplation and insists that the meaning of his work is its form, I think that actually there is a lot more going on there. You may also have heard of Damien Hirst. He's sort of the bad boy of the contemporary art world. Damien Hirst was born in Ireland, in, uh, sorry, England in 1965. Had a very troubled youth. He was arrested more than once. Uh, he managed somehow to get into Leeds College of Art, dropped out, then returned to Goldsmith College, University of London, where he got a degree. R before he graduated and right afterward, he had pieces in exhibition that gained him national attention. He had his first show, fo solo show in 1991. This led to a very advantageous arrangement with Charles Saatchi, the influential collector who essentially signed Hearst to a purchase agreement. Saatchi bought all of his work that he produced uh, or had first right of refusal. Uh, that relationship, by the way, went on until 2003 when they had very public uh, and um, violent uh, breaking of the partnership. In the 1990s, he, uh, Hearst gained notoriety for his misbehavior due to drug use and for his controversial art. He had a f his first solo show in America in 1996 and was part of the controversial exhibition Sensation at the Brooklyn Museum. In the decade from 2000-2009, his name came up mostly in relationship to auction news. Uh, he, 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 some of his pieces sold for just incredible prices. Uh, one piece for $19 million in 2007. Another piece, which I'll show you in a second, uh, for a hundred million dollars. And then in 2008, he did something very audacious, which won him no respect at all from the gallery world. He bypassed the gallery system and sold his work directly through Sotheby's auction. The 218 items that were sold netted him and his partners $198 million. 
Hearst is dramatically conceptual. He believes that the artist's most creative act is the conception. And he has little or nothing to do with the execution of his pieces. He early on set up a factory similar to Andy Warhol's and Jeff Koons with assistants doing the handwork and assembling of all of his pieces. The pieces that were so controversial in the sensation show at the Brooklyn Museum in 1999 were animals in vitrines. Uh, animals in uh, formaldehyde displayed in these large vitrines. The animals were usually altered in some way. Now this, this uh, shark isn't, but uh, frequently they were. There's one of a calf that has gold-plated horns, a cow and calf. Uh, were cut into sections and displayed in several boxes. Uh, this shark, though, was left whole. Uh, this one is titled, and this is wonderful, this is where being a conceptual artist comes in, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. Uh, more of these animals in vitrines and formaldehyde. I understand that the one that was in the Broad Museum in L.A. leaked, the tank leaked. Uh, they had to close the museum while they cleaned it up. Some of the um, other areas of his art include assistant-made spin paintings, dot paintings, butterfly wing assemblages, pseudo-natural history displays, pseudo-medical displays like you see here on uh, the detail of it, pharmaceuticals, natural history, pseudo-natural history, and uh, I guess medicine again. Uh, here's one of his assistant-made spin paintings. Uh, these are just like the age-old painting that you can do at carnivals or other places. Uh, the assistant doing all the work. And in addition, they spin on the wall in display. His dot paintings come in any variety of colors and numbers of dots. But once again, he's done none of these. So even though Hearst and his projects are controversial and the work is manufactured, I think his talent is that he seems to make us aware of the sense of the sublime and the absurd in the everyday. In his work, we cannot mistake the inevitability of death and decay in life, and he presents the beauty of death in his work that makes us all think differently about it. This is the piece that sold for $100 million. It is a human skull encrusted with diamonds. It's called For the Love of God. This took years to fabricate. Takashi Murakami, Japanese artist, born in 1963. He was encouraged to study art as a child and in his teens, he became infatuated with anime and manga and then pursued a degree in art from Tokyo National University. His early work was conceptual in nature and reflected his interest in art as a deluxe commodity. His heroes were Andy Warhol and Jeff Koons. In 1994, he won a fellowship to work in New York and shortly afterwards founded his first art factory called Hero Pond which uh, a name based on a uh, Japanese drug reference. He reorganized that company in 2001. The new name is Kai Kai Kiki Company, and uh, that's still what he operates, uh, his business name. By the late 1990s, he was a cultural hero in Japan and began gaining international attention. Nowadays, he is a worldwide cultural hero with cult-like adoration, especially in Japan, but he does have devotees all around the world. Murakami's style is called super flat. It's based on the style of Japanese anime and manga graphic work. The images are usually very densely patterned with cartoon-derived characters described in outlines in flat color applied or flat planes of color. 
It's remindful both of Japanese woodblock prints from the 18th and 19th centuries and the flatness of anime. The super flat, flat style is a celebration of repetitiveness and simplicity, of naivety and psychedelia. Murakami set out to create a style that was uniquely Japanese and that reflected the Japanese culture of today, not of the past. I think he was quite successful in that regard. But to further his aims, he founded a factory in New York, uh, all of Andy Warhol, all of Jeff Koons, and it mass produces his art, turning his art into a commodity and his name into a co corporate logo that represents the elimination of boundaries between high art and low art, between aesthetics and kitsch, and between originality and mass production. Uh, in the early 2000s, he began doing sculpture. Actually, he had done sculpture before, but he turned his super flat style into three dimensions. And um, I don't know what he calls this, I call it super fat. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's based upon the same type of imagery as the two dimensional work. In 2002-2003, he signed an agreement with Louis Vuitton, French designer company, and redesigned their logo pattern for their handbags and small leather goods. Uh, it includes multicolors in the, in the emblems and the addition of eyeballs. In the, and he also turns these patterns used on commodities into high art by selling them as paintings. Uh, in the Murakami exhibition that was in Los Angeles and other places around the world, 2008, 2009, there was a Wheaton boutique in the exhibition itself selling the handbags and address books with this pattern on it. It was a crass combination of art and commercialism and only highlighted the aspects of Murakami's work. By the way, I just found out, I assumed that MOCA, or Geffen Contemporary, where this exhibition was held, got a cut of the sales from the Wheaton Boutique. They didn't. Wheaton and Murakami made all the money. Uh, I said that he had done some sculpture. Uh, these are from the late 90s. Before he changed the name of his company from, uh, from Hiropon to Kai Kai Kiki, I find some of this work much more interesting than anything he's done since. It's edgy. It's sexual, it's, uh, it's, it has a maturity in the imagery that none of his subsequent work has. Uh, unfortunately, he dropped this type of imagery and replaced it with this kind of infantile, saccharine cuteness that dominates the rest of his work. Here is one of the pieces that was in the Murakami show in Los Angeles. Uh, now, this isn't a photograph from that show, but it is one of the pieces. And it is a rather buxom young woman uh, seemingly skipping rope with breast milk. This was a companion piece to the young man who is masturbating as his ejaculate forms a lasso-like ring over his head. This was the first thing you saw when you came in the exhibition. And not knowing anything about Murakami when I walked in, I thought, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was the only, let's call it mature themed work in the show. And it might, uh, the title of this figure is called My Lonesome Cowboy. <laughs> and it sold at auction in 2008 for $15.2 million. 
Murakami's contribution. Well, this was a hard one. <laughs> Except for absorbing the marketeering aspects of Warhol and Kuhn's, I find the most interesting aspect of Murakami's work to be that the imagery has arisen completely outside of the traditions of the Western world. His art reminds us that in spite of globalization, national character and sensibilities still exist and can be dynamic forces in the world art scene, whether that's easy to take or not. And the evidence of this is the worldwide adoration that Murakami has. He is a superstar in Japan and I think uh, attracts large crowds whenever he appears in person anywhere in the world. This is an Indian artist. His name is Subodh Gupta. Born in Kagal, India, 1964, now works and lives in New Delhi. Graduated from the College of Arts and Crafts in Patna in 1988 and began his career as a painter, moving on to installations by the mid-1990s. He gained a following in India and then he began receiving international attention and uh, especially with an installation they did called 29 Mornings. Today he is, well I'm sorry it's not today, but he has been a visiting lecturer in the uh, Col de Beaux-Arts in Paris and in 2005 was selected to be the representative for India at the Via Venice Biennale. And as a matter of fact, several of these artists that I'm showing you were representatives for their countries at the Venice Biennale, which is an international art show every other year, every uh, odd year uh, that takes place in Venice. Countries have pavilions in the old Arsenale at, at, in Venice. Whether painting, sculpture, or installation, Gupta's work always seems to be linked to the experience of his humble rural childhood in India. Commonplace items like buckets, tiffin boxes, tally pans, and milk pails are frequent materials or subjects in his work, symbols of everyday life in India. They can be read as either the artist stereotyping his culture or as heroic emblems of a simpler life. Another element of Gupta's work is, is the material vocabulary that he uses and one of the most famous pieces he did involved cow dung. Uh, now in India cow dung is used to construct houses, it's also used as fuel, and it's used for ritual purification uh, because it's believed to be very pure or very clean. In his art Gupta did several different things with cow dung. For one thing he covered himself in it for a video He's also cast it in bronze, and he's done cow dung paintings, none of which are, are I'm showing you. Uh, but I find this really interesting because he essentially translates manure into luxury art. Some argue that he is simply stereotyping India or exploiting cliches of India or what people think about India, but he, I think he's really using the cliches and the, as an aesthetic to symbolize Indian culture. His contribution, I believe at this point, and he's still a young artist, an emerging artist, his contribution is that he has brought attention to India on the international art scene. His work highlights the contrast between India and the Western world but it also con highlights many contrasts in India itself, its culture and history, the rural versus the urban, the rustic versus the technology of the 21st century, poverty versus the well-educated middle class in India. Now he is also, uh, and by the way, this uh, piece appeared at the Venice Biennale. Here it is on display in Venice. Uh, also a shameless self-promoter, uh, Gupta is well aware of the attention he's brought to India, to his homeland, and is very serious about, about that attention and 
uh, highlighting the complexity of his culture in the modern world. Please forgive me if I pronounce this wrong. Sai Guo Cheng. Meiji, are you there? Is that okay? Thank you. Uh, Chinese artist, born in 1957 in Guangzhou City in China. He really has become the best known and most influential Chinese artist working. He trained in stage design uh, when, after he moved to Japan. Then he moved to New York in 1995, and he still lives there, and that's where his studio is established. He began experimenting with and exploring the properties of gunpowder while in Japan, making drawings from explosions. This led to an interest in more massive explosions as he developed his signature explosive events, or fireworks shows. They're known by another name. Uh, he won the Golden Lion Prize at the 1999 Venice Biennale and was curator for the Chinese Pavilion for the 2005 Venice Biennale. The Guggenheim hosted a mid-career retrospective for Tsai in 2008, uh, which also traveled to Beijing and Bilbao. And in, also in 2008, he was the visual director for the opening ceremonies of the Beijing Olympics. And here are a couple of stills from the Olympics, uh, the, the fireworks show, but he was, at, he was visual director for all of the opening ceremonies. He is known for drawing on a widespread variety of symbols, of narratives, traditions, materials, including things like feng shui, Chinese medicine, dragons, roller coasters, computers, vending machines, and gunpowder. He's cultivated relationships with scientists, doctors, feng shui masters, designers, architects, choreographers, filmmakers, composers, who all become collaborators in his work. Much of his work is on a very difficult scale hard to encompass, but also very hard to commodify. And so uh, a lot of his output is not things that can be purchased or bought and sold. Instead, the installations and other work become very ambitious but poetic dialogues between the artist, the viewer, and the space they occupy. His work is about the message and he frequently incorporates Maoist concepts in his work, things like destroy nothing, create nothing, or no destruction, no construction. But the thing that bothers me about his work is that there doesn't seem to be a viewpoint. There doesn't seem to be commentary on the part of the artist. It's presentation. He signifies his awareness of issues of present-day concerns like terrorism or Berlin Wall or cultural revolution, plight of farm workers. But his work doesn't really comment or explore these issues. It's presentation without engagement. However, the presentation is quite showy and entertaining, and I think that that is probably one of the reasons why his work is so highly regarded. Uh, these are stills from the Guggenheim show, uh, and that's all I'm going to show you from that show. But it's, um, it's, there was this car suspended in the atrium of the Guggenheim, and I was puzzled by it, to say the least. But I finally realized that I believe it's supposed to represent an explosion, a car as it goes through an explosion. Uh, the gunpowder drawings. These, I think, are his most accessible work and, I think, most successful work. They are along the lines of the Dadaist plan accidents. Uh, the actual process is not precisely con controlled, but the results are something of tremendous visual and aesthetic appeal. His work is very visually engaging and technically astounding in some cases, but keep in mind he has large teams of assistants and specialists that help him with these presentations. But he does have a penchant for making something extraordinary out of the ordinary 
while also incorporating elements of Chinese history and philosophy in the mix. Sean Scully. Scully was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1945, but he grew up in England. His education in art was at Croydon College of Art in London, also at Newcastle University, and later at Harvard. In 1969, he went to Morocco, and like so many artists and people before him, he was extremely influenced by the bright colors and the textiles that he saw there. And after returning home, adapted those bright colors and stripes of textiles as a motif for his paintings. He is still using the same motif. 1972, he won a fellowship to Harvard and then later moved to New York City and became a citizen of the U.S. in 1983. He's exhibited widely in the U.S., Europe, and around the world. He uh, has had many major exhibits including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2008. And he's currently the professor, a professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, Germany. Scully is, in my mind, the great abstractionist of the postmodern era. His subject matter has been, for at least 25 years now, stripes. Or more specifically, or more generally actually, geometric abstraction. His geometric compositions are not hard-edged, although he worked in that style briefly, but instead he uses an expressive, irregular edged style of hand-built compositions. He is first and foremost a painter, employing traditional techniques such as texturing, layering, scraping, overpainting, and gestural application of paint. He works the surface over and over until he has the depth and texture that he desires, creating space, drama, and narrative potential. His motif of stripes has been worked endlessly, but he's still producing interesting, appealing, and startling works of art full of character and resonance. Like Robert Motherwell's Elegy to the Spanish Republic series and Richard Diebenkorn's Ocean Park series, which used a recurring motif in about 180 paintings. Scully is continually inventive with his theme, and in any one composition, the, co the stripes will vary in color, length, width, and direction. They're also frequently separate canvases inset into a larger painting, or two or three or more canvases joined together to create a large composition. And when he does this, it really moves from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. His contribution, I believe, is that he is carrying the flag for abstraction and expressive painting and making it work even in the early 20th century, 21st century, when many artists and critics are saying that painting has exhausted all of the possibilities that, and that abstraction is now passé. Among other things, Scully is an articulate defender of painting and argues successfully through his work and his, in his role as an artist educator that abstraction is a viable and successful means of visual expression and that modernism still has something to signify. Mike and Doug Starn. Twin brothers, born in New Jersey in 1961. Their work is photography-based, but moves into other genres, including sculpture, painting, performance, and installation. They had received nat national attention before graduating from the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and quickly built an international presence. Most recently, they have done a permanent installation for the New York City Metropolitan Transit Authority's Art for Transit program. Uh, their work is called See It Split, See It Change, and it just opened last January, I believe, in the South Ferry Subway Terminal in New York. Recently, they've also had a solo exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and uh, have exhibited a monumental sculptural piece called Big Bamboo on the roof at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City on view until 
still October 31st. It's really cool. They I w they yeah, they did that. Mike and Doug Starn. They're still working on it. They yeah, they climb still around. Still yeah. Are they? Every day. Yeah, every day. They're, their work usually begins with a photograph, frequently a work of art from the European canon of art history, usually taken with large format camera, 4x5 or 8x10. They print the images on various non-traditional materials using silver and or non-traditional techniques along with technological and digital ma manipulation, altering the original in very many ways. Fragmenting, repeating, reversing, destroying the expectation of quality frequently. They rip, scratch, fold, crumble, and otherwise distress their surfaces. The prints are usually mounted in various ways, uh, some on thin wood, bent into curves with pipe clamps, uh, which adds a third dimension, and uh, sometimes on boards leaning against a wall or on layers of plexigraph as these are right here. From the beginning, they have pieced their photographs together with scotch tape exploiting both the seams between pieces and the process of creation. The tape will yellow over time, and as it does, it'll stain the prints to which it is attached by using scotch tape and the other means by which they employ to distress their work. They ignore the idea of the necessity of archi archival materials and operate against the work of art as a fixed entity. These pieces will change over time. If any of you know me and my work, you'll understand why I find their work very appealing because there are such uh, wonderful aspects of collage in it. Their contribution, by altering the traditional stability and flatness of photographs with dimension and dynamism, the Starn brothers have challenged the nature of photography by redefining it. They've taken it from traditional two-dimensional to a three-dimensional time-based media. Looks like Peter Beard. Francis Elise, born in 1959 in Belgium. He initially trained as an engineer and architect. He moved to Mexico City in 1986, where he still lives and works, and began practicing as a visual artist. His first solo show was in 1991, with major exhibitions in England, Germany, France, and the U.S. shortly afterwards. He participated in the Venice Biennale in 2001 and again in 2007. His work is extremely difficult to illustrate, and I apologize for the pixelation here. His work encompasses many media and frequently involves the artist and the unwitting or sometimes voluntary participation of others. Most of his projects are performed, events, documented in video, photographs, writing, painting, and animation. He reverses the usual artistic investigation of the nature of art in his work. Instead, he contemplates the nature of work in his art. Uh, the work has included pushing a block of ice around the streets of Mexico City until it melted, or having 500 people try to move a sand dune, shovelful by shovelful. The result of the work, in Elise's view, seems to be that all is for naught. The ice melts. The dune does not perceptibly move. The result is nothing, the meaning avoid. Through the films and documentation of his project, it becomes clear that the artist is using the process as both subject and meaning in his work. This can be extrapolated to situations outside of the realm of art, perhaps to life itself, 
what better example of a situation where the journey is the destination than life, where the process of living is the meaning. This work by Elise is actually a display. It is called Fabiola. It has been on view at LA County Museum of Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art. I saw it at the National Portrait Gallery in London and I know it went to other places after that. It is over 300 nearly identical paintings after a lost original from the 19th century of the Saint Fabiola. Elise purchased all of these works in thrift stores or antique stores or junk stores uh, over the last 20 years or so. And they're not all paintings. Uh, there are boxes, there's jewelry, there are other things. I missed this in LA, I missed it in New York, and I was really happy to catch up with it in London a couple years ago uh, and was overwhelmed. Uh, though the artist had nothing to do with any of these paintings, what we do get a glimpse of is sort of the obsessive nature of collecting and of organizing uh, because he directs the installation of this when it travels. The contribution. I think the value of his work is the cognizant response he evokes from the viewer. Deeply conceptual, his projects precipitate a crisis of meaning, us usually leaving us to conclude that there is no meaning in what he has done, nor in the parallel real-life situations. His work is about process. Process is an end not the steps necessary to achieve a goal or a conclusion. Olafur Eliasson, born in Copenhagen in 1967 of Icelandic parentage. He attended the Royal Danish Academy of Art from 89 to 95 and in 1996 began working with an architect named Einar Thornstein who was and continues to be influential upon Eliasson's artistic production, especially in the areas of geometry and space. Eliasson was a representative for Denmark at the 2003 Venice Biennale. His first museum show in the United States was Take Your Time, Olafar Eliasson, presented at SF MoMA 2007 and 8, and then later in 2008 at Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He currently lives and works in Berlin. It is almost impossible to describe a style when talking about Eliasson's work. His projects are extremely varied. They range from falling water to light displays. Most of his work is sort of about landscape, uh, but a, a very theatrical treatment or usage of the landscape. His work evokes a discourse about boundaries or lack of them and between nature and culture. His materials for projects are frequently the weather, water, light, temperature, pressure, as well as eccentric geometry. And here I'm showing you a couple slides from the Take Your Time show, uh, rooms full of these eccentric geometric objects. Here's some descriptions, short descriptions of some of his projects. A sun-like billboard, 41 yards in diameter, hovering above the skyline of Utrecht. Waterfalls in the East River in Manhattan. Uh, and these are not pictures of any of those. This is, though. Uh, a yellow light emitting disc and mirrored ceiling representing the sun and sky in the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. I'll show you that in a second. A sequence of spaces filled with water, fog, earth, wood, fungus, and duckweed a waterfall that flowed upward. Various rivers in Europe and America colored with green dye. Here are pictures of his waterfalls project in the East River in New York. Uh, I missed this on my sabbatical by about two weeks. Uh, he erected towers from which water fell in 13 spots along the East River. Uh, generally, people saw it from boats in the river. Now, 
the difficult part about Eliason's work, but also the part that I think is his great contribution, is that the work is experiential. You have to have seen it to understand it. You have to have been there to have the opportunity. But that exclusivity is really part of his philosophy and it's engendered into his thinking. His work is about the experience of his work. It's about the viewer seeing. In this way, his work somewhat imitates life in that it's about how people perceive and inhabit their surroundings. These are photographs from the, the project was called the Weather Project. A giant light emitting disc was erected in the, the old turbine hall in the Tate Modern. The Tate Modern is a museum of contemporary art, or 20th century art anyway, um, that used to be a power station. They took out the giant turbines, leaving this huge empty space. He put up this light emitting disc and the ceiling is mirrored. It was scheduled to be up, I believe, three months. The people of England loved it so much, loved the artificial sunlight that they were getting, that they convinced <laughs> him to leave it for six months. Richard Feldern, are you here? I have a former student who is now teaching on campus who saw this. Well, for, a, for a, a, a climate where the sun frequently does not shine, I would imagine this was really like a ray of sunshine. But I think you can see what I mean about it being experiential. El Anatsui. Anatsui was born in 1944 in Ghana. He studied at the College of Art in Kamasi, graduating in 1969. He taught in Ghana, then he moved to Nigeria in 1975, assuming a position at the University of Nigeria in Nasuka. He's currently still there, head of the sculpture department. He rose to prominence in the 1960s and 70s. He's exhibited widely in Africa, Europe, Asia, North America and recently has see, re, been receiving international acclaim and attention. The result of which he's now probably the most influential African artist working. He was represented, uh, a, he represented his country in the Venice Biennale in 2007. He's worked with many materials in his life, wood, ceramics, paint, but what he's known for are these metal textiles. These are compositions composed of metal strips fastened together at the four corners with wire. The metal, which is aluminum, comes from the necks of liquor bottles. He sometimes uses the bottle caps also, but apparently in Africa there are dozens of distilleries and they produce hard liquor in the equivalent of soda pop bottles but each of these bottles has a metal strip around the neck and of course a bottle cap. And Anatsui apparently has his uh, own recycling program going, uh, having people who, who remove these strips from the bottles found at dumps or other, other places and uses them to great effect in his art. Sometimes one of his compositions has thousands of these strips all wired together by teams of assistants, I would imagine hundreds of people. Uh, the, the, the large compositions are very much like textiles in the way they drape and hang, but they are in fact quite malleable and the artist takes great care in arranging the swelling and rippling forms when he installs them. I think these are really magical in their appearance, but it's also magical in the way he transforms these recycled materials into something of such beauty and originality. The comparison between the metal textiles 
and Ghanaian textiles is unavoidable. Anatsui acknowledges that there is a visual anesthetic link between his pieces and kenti cloth. And on the right here is a photo of uh, a kenti cloth. A kenti cloth is a very densely patterned, finely woven prestige cloth worn by the upper classes in Ghana. It is woven from silk. There's another piece of it on the bottom. And here's a man wearing kenti cloth and a detail of how it's woven. It's woven in narrow strips by male weavers. Uh, the patterns are numerous, but they are all named. And uh, this, this uh, weaving is incredibly fine. There are hundreds of stitches per inch in these weavings, so it takes ages to make one of these cloths. The strips are woven together, or I'm sorry, are sewn together after being woven and then uh, a textile created. Anatsui on the left. That's Anatsui's work on the, uh, that's, I mean, a piece by Anatsui, not Anatsui itself. This is the Ghanaian king. <laughs> his contribution is large. Uh, his, his pieces are informed by age-old traditions in Africa while being constructive materials that are thoroughly modern. It's post-consumer junk, essentially. The designs and materials reference the struggles of contemporary West Africa while alluding to the painful colonial legacy of Nigeria and other countries in Africa. Through the gather gathering and utilization of these scraps, Anatsui brings in the convergence of African, European, and American history to the form, content, and meaning of these pieces. Those are bottle caps. Um, it seems that I ran across pieces by Anatsui everywhere I went on my sabbatical. I unfortunately don't have a, there's a detail of them. Uh, I don't have a picture of the one at the LA County Museum of Art, but they have a beautiful one. It's not on display right now. Uh, but they are, uh, most major museums now have a piece by him. By the way, this is for the Venice Biennale, a huge piece draped on the front of one of the palazzos. Uh, this one is owned by the De Young Museum in San Francisco. This one by the Metropolitan Museum in New York. They have two Anatsuis. George Pompidou Center in Paris. And the British Museum in London. So he's well represented. Another word about Jeff Koons. I just couldn't leave him alone. <laughs> 2008, during my sabbatical, Jeff Koons' sculpture of an oversized red heart sold at Sotheby's for $23.6 million, making it, at that point, the most expensive piece by a living artist ever auctioned. That record hold, oh, f or held five minutes or so. A Lucian Freud painting sold for more than that shortly afterwards. But also in 2008, Koons' Uh, had 17 of his sculptures displayed in Versailles in France, giving him a remarkable and invaluable official sanction. In December of 2008, I went to Paris. I went to see three Picasso exhibitions, but there was the added bonus of this Kuhn's exhibition at Versailles taking place at the same time. Versailles, if you haven't seen it, this is the gate is an ornate, opulent, and really over-the-top palace built by King Louis XIV uh, in the 17th century. The exhibition was titled simply Jeff Koons at Versailles and was really something of a mini retrospective of Koons's work with the pieces set in the royal apartments 
and a two outside, this is one. Reportedly, Coons picked the seven pieces in the exhibition very carefully to highlight the similarities and differences in themes and style between his work and the 17th century palace. I'm anxious to go to Versailles, having been there only once in 1967, but I went assuming I'd be angered by the audacity of this exhibition and this whole contemporary art and historic setting idea. However, it took this far, the first salon, for me to be won over by the whole concept of the exhibition and in general by Kunz's work. In short, I loved it. There are several reasons why I was won over, and I'll give them to you. First, Kunz's pieces are exquisitely crafted and negotiate a boundary between high art and kitsch. Versailles is exquisitely crafted and straddles a fine line between high art and oppressive opulence. I thought that the juxtaposition of Kunz's sculpture and the classical, <laughs> classical Baroque architecture and decoration was daring, thought-provoking, and visually very rewarding. Second, the type of artistic decadence and innovative creativity that was the hallmark of the Versailles style was well suited to become the context for Kunz's work which is usually seen in the more austere setting of contemporary art museums. And I'm showing you each of these pieces in a museum setting. Blank white behind it, surrounding it. This is done purposely in museums so that the focus is on the art. However, at Versailles, I didn't feel that Kunz's work in any way faded to the background when it had to compete with this rather ornate backdrop. Instead, the mundane subjects of Kunz's pieces really stood out in the visual chaos of the salons, holding their own in this context. This is self-portrait. It's done in Carrara marble. And this is a copy of a 17th century bust of Louis XIV, reinvented by Jeff Koons in stainless steel. There's the Hall of Mirrors. The piece on the panel is called Moon. I had to look to find this one. The yeah, the flowers. Uh -huh. This is the big red heart that sold for $23.6 million. The third reason I like this is that Kunz's work actually worked to recontextualize Versailles. During the exhibition, the old palace was transformed from a somewhat stuffy historic relic into a very vibrant exhibition and exhibition space, while still commanding respect for the history and artistry of the building. The lesson I learned at Versailles ended up being the big lesson I learned from my year's research of contemporary art, namely, that which is new is not necessarily daunting, is not something to fear. The art of today may look different from anything we're used to because artists are using new techniques, new te technology, new materials, new forms, new themes. But art is still functioning the same way it always has, to express the ideas and experiences of the artist through visual means. If one contemplates contemporary art by keeping in mind that it is a 
continuation of great traditions of the past rather than as a complete break from everything that is familiar, I think you'll find, like I did, that there's no need to be afraid of contemporary art. Thank you. Sure. I want to show.